Uh, just after I said technology is such a great thing. But uh, so here we go. And uh, so I want to talk to you about a Christian response to social justice. And you may have heard of social justice through some of its other names, um, names like critical race theory, progressivism. Uh, you may have heard of uh, terms like safe space, positive space, um, equity studies. Uh, you may have heard of um, other names such as, again, Black Lives Matter. All of these are all part of the same framework. They all come from a Marxist worldview. Don't let the word social justice confuse you because what this movement means by social justice is not what the scriptures mean by social justice. Uh, scripture makes it very clear that justice is rooted and founded in the triune God of scripture, who is the very basis, the very moral basis of all goodness and, and justice itself. And so when the contemporary society speaks about social justice, what they're talking about is really a Marxist worldview that divides the world into oppressor and oppressed. And the oppressor is the white, straight male, the Western man who is a uh, Christian. They are considered oppressors. They're responsible for the slave trade. They're responsible for the Crusades. They're responsible for all the ills that we have seen in history and in society whereas the oppressed are groups that have been marginalized or have been taken advantage of by the so-called oppressors. And these are simply old terms, actually new terms for very old terms. Uh, Karl Marx spoke about the same ideology, but he spoke about the, the uh, bourgeois, the bourgeoisie, which is the capitalist ruling class and the proletariat, the working class. And he believed that the capitalist class was oppressing the working class. So it's the same type of framework, it's just with new language that has been added to the mix. So if we can just go to the next slide, I wanna say a little bit about the conflict between globalism and nationalism. And if you notice, uh, there is a lot of talk about uh, a free border world, a world without borders. And nations that are proud of their history and their ethnicity, of course, uh, like the United States and, and many others, you'll notice that there's a pushback, particularly on the Democrat uh, Party front, that is basically saying we should just have an open border policy and just let anybody in who wants to come in. And you will notice that under the presidency of, of President Donald Trump, he was intent on building that wall to protect the southern border of the United States. And you will notice with the Biden administration, they they, they pulled out on that, uh, at least momentarily. And if you listen to the rhetoric that's coming out of Washington, the rhetoric is about a free world, a free society. Now, this is a very, very dangerous worldview because globalism has its origins at the Tower of Babel. And if you remember at the Tower of Babel, this was when people were all one, they spoke one language, and they wanted to make a name for themselves, and they created this, this tower, what, what is called a ziggurat in the ancient Near East, and they wanted to make this edifice to their glory and to their fame. And they were in disobedience against God, instead of spreading out and filling the earth as God had commanded in Genesis 1 and 2, they were disobeying God by congregating and remaining in one place. And so their ideal was to create this one global state. And at the same time, they had one language, they were one people, and you will notice that that event is called the Tower of Babel. Now it's interesting that the word Babel uh, also means confusion. So when people are babbling, they are not making any sense. A babbler is someone that is incoherent. And so what you will notice is that this global one world government idea is one that lends itself, itself over to confusion. Not just confusion about God, but confusion about gender identity, confusion about national identity. And the very things that we're struggling with today in contemporary society are questions about identity. What the find sexual identity and so forth. And the idea of nationalism is rooted in scripture itself. When God called Abraham 
or Abram out of Ur of the Chaldees, you remember what he said. He says, get thee out of your country and go to a land that I will show you. And then he says, I will make a great nation out of you. And out of the nation that God would create out of Abraham, all the families of the earth, all the nations of the earth would be blessed. And so God is the creator of nation states. God is not the creator of this global agenda. It is a nation state that God created out of Abraham. And it's through the multiplicity of the nations that God is bringing his glory to bear. And of course, in the book Revelation chapter seven, what do we see around the throne? People of every nation, every tongue, people of every tribe, they're gathered around the throne of God and they are glorifying God and the lamb. And so the book of Revelation shows the congregated elect people of God as a multinational entity, people who've been called from every nation to salvation. And so the very concept of globalism is a very dangerous one. It is a return to Babel. And in, and in so doing, it is simply a return to spiritual confusion. Now, if we can go to the next slide, globalism is simply newspeak for communism. And if you're familiar with George Orwell's book, 1984, uh, one of the things that he mentions in his book is this thing called Newspeak. And Newspeak basically is the government is creating new language. And so uh, part of this new langu language would be things like, for example, pronouns. So today, people will say that you can identify as a he, a she, an it, a zer, a z, and any, any pronouns you wish. Uh, and so there, there is confusion. There's this Newspeak, words like woke, uh, being woke is a form of newspeak. It, it, it talks about someone becoming aware uh, of their marginality. For example, black people realizing that that uh, America is racist and that America has kept them, uh, kept them subdued and so forth. And so you'll hear these new words coming up, words like cisgender, meaning you are straight or heterosexual. And you will hear words again like woke. And these are new vocabularies that are being created, which is part of this agenda. And so globalism is simply another term for communism. And communism has always intended to create a, a utopia that is a one world government with a one government that rules over all and everyone comes under the big state government. Now we go to the next slide. Another problem we find in this movement is there is an attack on the world's population. And you will hear a lot of these folks talking about that we have too many humans on the earth. And so Bill Gates and uh, Margaret Sanger, the founder of Planned Parenthood, and many others in this boat have come along and said, we need to depopulate the earth. We have too many people on the earth which again is a myth, because what did God command um, the first human pair? He said, fill the earth and spread out, fill the earth and be fruitful. But what we are seeing now is a move where this ideology is limiting the image of God, human beings, and placing them on an inferior scale to, for example, the environment. And so you'll hear a lot of folks talk about the environment and and climate change. Notice it's no longer global warming, now it's climate change and the terms keep, keep changing all the time. The point is that we need to help Mother Earth. Mother Earth is in peril and the problem is we've got way too many humans. And so we need to start culling these human beings from the Earth. We, uh, humans have tried this in history with genocide, with eugenics. Uh, eugenics was actually born in the United States in the uh, late 1920s and 30s, and it was from the United States that Adolf Hitler was impressed with people like Margaret Sanger and others, which influenced his idea of also uh, forwarding this idea of eugenics, that in Germany that the Aryan race was the superior super race, and all these others, the Jews and everyone else, they were, they were vermin, they were subhuman and so forth. And so this push to depopulate the earth is also an attack upon God's sovereignty, just as globalism is an attack against God's sovereignty. Now, if we go to the next slide, here's a quote from Ted Turner, and he's right, right uh, on the same page on this. He says, we are too many people. That's why we have global warming. On a voluntary basis, everybody in the world's got to pledge to themselves that one child is it. 
And so what he's basically saying is it's basically the same rule that China had, the one child rule. And Ted Turner thinks that the problem with global warming is because we have too many people on the earth. And now they're saying it's because we have too many cows and because uh, of the flatulence that cows are emitting, this is causing problems with the environment. And so uh, you've got people like Bill Gates now saying, we're gonna create synthetic beef so that we can eat synthetic beef and stop eating cattle. Uh, so you see the issue here, folks, is not that humans are the image of God, the Imago Dei, that they are the crown of God's creation, that man is God's vice region on the earth, but that man is the enemy of planet earth. And so you will see here that not only the marginalization of man as man, as God's image bearer, but in so doing, they denigrate the creator because God placed the earth under our dominion. He gave us dominion over the fish of the sea and over the, the birds of the air and, and, and over the, 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 the beasts of the field and the creeping things and so forth. Man was created to rule on God's behalf on the earth as God's temple abode. But what this social justice movement is doing is it's seeking to dethrone God and of course to place man not even lower than animals but lower than dirt itself lower than the earth itself now if we look at the next slide we need to also understand that particularly in the united states where this has become a a hotbed uh anti-wall equals pro-globalism and so those who are saying we don't need walls to protect the southern border of the united states are invariably people who have this pro-global agenda now here's the funny thing, those who claim we shouldn't have any walls protecting your nation are the same people who live in places in the United States with high walls, with security, with armed uh, security and so forth and so on. Um, Barack Obama, uh, his property is surrounded by very high walls and yet he keeps talking about we should be a borderless world. Uh, even the Pope, uh, Pope Frankie, is saying that uh, we should allow all these refugees into Europe and, and we should have an open border uh, policy. But if you've ever been to the Vatican, they've got pretty big walls there and those walls ain't tumbling down anytime soon. And so why is it that people are comfortable living in their private homes with fences and security and uh, they have alarm systems set up, but yet when it comes to national security, um, the president of the United States, when Donald Trump was president, he certainly did not have the right to close the border because he would be a bigot if he did so. And so what you need to understand is that this influx of illegal people into the country is what is contributing to not only a high rate of crimes in the United States, but they're also coming even up into Canada where they're, uh, they're crossing uh, illegally from Vermont into, uh, into the province of Quebec in Canada and a lot of these folks come over and uh, many of them just remain on welfare, on a welfare system paid by the tax, uh, taxpayers. And so we need to understand that those who protest against the wall are invariably pro-globalists. They're into this social justice movement. If we go to the next slide, I just want to mention here at home, uh, we have a prime minister here who is an absolute disaster and uh, he, he defines my country, Canada, as a post-nationalist state with no core identity. And he, he blames um, uh, Canada for the ills that the Native American people have here in Canada. He's accused Canada of being racist, even though he's worn blackface three times uh, and, until he got caught. And um, he is one of the world's greatest proponents of abortion. Uh, sends millions of dollars overseas to fund abortion and what he calls sexual reproductive rights for women. The other thing we need to understand as well is that this prime minister here in Canada gave a, gave a $600 million handout to the Canadian media for over five years in keeping with the global compact's requirement for a docile media trained in UN speak to enable the making of a UN envisioned borderless global order. Justin Trudeau, is in bed with the UN in terms of this globalist vision. He has spoken about the Great Reset as well. A lot of folks spoke about the Great Reset as this myth. Uh, it's not a myth. Uh, the World Economic Forum it talks about this. 
It talks about a world in which you will own nothing and you will be happy. Uh, again, at the root of all this, there is a satanic element. There's a satanic uh, work at play here. And if the church ignores this, she ignores it at her own peril. Now, if we go to the next slide, um, at a parliamentary press dinner on May 4th, 2019, uh, which is available, you could see this on YouTube, uh, Prime Minister Justin Trudeau was actually joking about the fact that the media has been very soft with him. They've been giving him softball questions and they've been very, very, uh, very tame with him. And he says, well, they should be because I gave them $600 million. Now that type of rhetoric is the rhetoric we hear coming out of communist countries where the media is state run. It's state, uh, state run media control. And this is comparable to CNN, for example, in your country, where CNN used to come after President Trump for anything they can think of, and yet they they simply skim over many of the things that President Biden has said in recent days, including the fact that he claims that the greatest threat to the United States is white supremacy. But this is this is part and parcel of this worldview that sees the white man as the arch enemy of all that is good in society. Now, if we go to the next slide, what does scripture tell us? Well, scripture keeps telling us over and over again that we ought to be always alert and vigilant. And so here in 1 Peter 5, verse 8, the apostle says, be alert and of a sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Our enemy is always on the prowl. Our enemy does not take coffee breaks. And we need to be aware of him. We need to, as the Apostle Paul says, we, 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 we are not ignorant of Satan's devices. And we also need to understand in the next slide, we have a quote here from 1 John 5, 19. We know that we are from God and the whole world lies in the power of the evil one. We need to take this seriously. The whole world, that is the world of, the, of unregenerate men, of reprobate men and women, lies in the power of the evil one. And the, as Luther said in his song, A Mighty Fortress is Our God, um, he says that the prince of darkness grim, he, he, he doesn't care for us, he, he will work us woe. But one small word, word will fell him, and that word, of course, is the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. So we need to be aware that our world lies in the power of this evil one, that the Lord Jesus Christ came to appear to destroy the works of the devil. In the next slide, we are reminded in the book of Revelation, uh, chapter 12, verse 9, that the great dragon was thrown down, that ancient serpent who was called the devil and Satan, the deceiver of the whole world, not just part of the world, but the deceiver of the whole world. And he was thrown down to the earth and his angels were thrown down with him. The Lord Jesus also referred to him as the prince of this world, the ruler of this world. And so every form of government that seeks to displace the sovereignty of God is under the power of this evil one that we contend with, that we struggle with. And once again, we must not lose sight of this. We are at war. We don't wrestle with flesh and blood, but with, spirit, with principalities and, and authorities and thrones and, 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 and powers in, in, in these high places. In the next slide, Netflix uh, was accused of sexualizing girls in an upcoming French movie called Cuties. And so what this, what this Netflix show was about was basically taking these little girls, underage girls, 11-year-old girls, and basically have them dancing in provocative dances and, and what they call twerking. Um, I don't know if you saw recently in, in Manhattan, in New York City, they had a little girl, she must have been at least three years old, and they were all clapping as this little girl was trying to twerk where she's moving her body in a provocative sexual manner. And so here's this, this Netflix company promoting a show or a movie that would be any pedophile's dream. Little girls provocatively dancing. And once again, these are, these are we're not talking about adults here, we're talking about little girls how have we come to a point in our countries in the west where we are sexualizing little children this is part of the agenda 
the agenda of the left and the social justice movement is to undermine the nuclear family that is the family that God has designed as a mother, a father, and a child. And some of these movements like BLM have made it very clear that they are against the nuclear family, that they're against the principle of the nuclear family because they believe that it is, that it is a Christian institution. Now, if we go to the next slide, uh, Netflix has also promoted uh, movies that clearly blaspheme the Lord Jesus Christ. And so on the left side there, uh, you notice there that uh, you have Paris Jackson, the daughter of Michael Jackson, who wanted to play uh, in a movie depicting Jesus as a lesbian woman. So notice again the transgender idea there that even though Jesus was a man, they wanted to depict him as a lesbian woman. And then if you look here on the top right, the popular Disney show features Network's first bisexual um, main, I don't know if that's a typo, man. Disney's channel featured its first openly bisexual main character in its show, The Owl House, and the decision is going to alienate many of its Christian uh, subscribers. And so Disney now is pushing this LGBTQ, this transgender idea and uh, Hallmark movies are featuring now lesbian weddings on the bottom, uh, the, the bottom left corner there. And so you could see that they're promoting this particular worldview. And remember, the whole idea of using media to dull the senses is something that has been in the works for the last 70 years or so. The cultural Marxists that came to America in the late 1930s starting with Columbia University in New York and then moving into Hollywood to enter into the, the media and into the radio waves, they deliberately did this to undermine the nuclear family, the idea of heterosexuality, and to bring about the destruction of Christian moral values. So this would not even be thinkable 50 years ago, but this is now presented as something progressive. And right now in the month of June, I'm sure in the United States, just like Canada, they declared June as Pride Month. And it's quite interesting when you think about it, we honor our dead. Uh, I know in the United States, you honor your, your fallen soldiers on Memorial Day. And during that day, you remember those heroes who gave their lives for our freedoms. Uh, here in Canada, we celebrated on November 11th on Remembrance Day. But isn't it interesting that we give our heroes one day of the year to remember them? And in some cases, we will have a moment of silence, probably a minute, to remember our fallen dead. But yet, a, an abomin a community that practices abominations before God in, in its sexual expressions is given a full month with their own flag. The perversion of the rainbow, that, that covenant sign that God made with Noah by placing the rainbow in the sky to show his covenant that he would never destroy the earth with a flood. The homosexual LGBTQ community has taken this beautiful, beautiful representation of God's covenant with Noah, and they've perverted it to refer to their diversity, so-called. In the next slide, uh, we also know that uh, many child abusers have run rampant as tech companies look the other way. And so groups like Facebook and Twitter, uh, I know that uh, Twitter has just recently banned uh, Pornhub which was a site that promoted pornography on Twitter, but because of many complaints and, and, and lawsuits and so forth, they have now banned uh, Pornhub. But there's no doubt about the fact that many, many pedophiles and sexual predators have used companies like Facebook and Twitter and Instagram uh, to, to promote their ideologies. And yet it's these very same companies that shut down conservative voices. Now let's go to the next slide. And here on the top, uh, you can see the enemies of humanity, uh, people like Adolf Hitler, Benito Mussolini, Joseph Stalin, Pol Pot, and Mao Zedong. Now, who are the enemies of humanity? Well, the enemies of humanity are those who are seeking to muzzle our voices, who are seeking to suppress our voices. So people like Mark Zuckerberg with Facebook and Jack Dorsey with Twitter, um, and Jeff Bezos with Amazon and Sundar uh, Pichai with Google and Tim Cook with Apple. And of course, remember during the elections in the United States, 
Facebook and uh, Twitter under the instructions of Zuckerberg and Dorsey basically shut down conservative voices. Uh, they've even, they even uh, censored President Donald Trump. And so instead of remaining neutral, being neutral, which they're supposed to be, they are actually acting as, as political, uh, political uh, activists. Uh, they're, they're showing clear party bias. Instead of being neutral and just putting out information, they're censoring free speech. And so uh, some of my friends uh, in apologetics, they've had their YouTube channels uh, demonetized. Uh, they've had their Twitter accounts suspended. Uh, and that's simply because uh, if you don't uh, tow the leftist narrative, the party line of the left, you're going to be censored. And that's what these people on the top did. They took control of the media outlets. They controlled what you heard. They put out propaganda. And that's exactly what we see. And so you take someone like Tim Cook with Apple. Um, he will talk about how, how oppressive the United States is, but yet all of his products are produced in China, in, in sweat labor uh, factories, where he has the Chinese being paid a, a just uh, a, a, a terrible uh, income, uh, just a few dollars, uh, just to, to make his products that he makes incredible profits on. Think of someone like Jeff Bezos, who during the COVID pandemic has made record profits uh, because people were ordering from Amazon because their local stores were being shut down due to these uh, so-called COVID restrictions. And so the people today who control the media and control uh, social media are the very same people that are censoring uh, voices and censoring legitimate debate. And remember, the whole concept that made the West great was the concept of academic freedom and the freedom of expression. Your First Amendment rights promise you that. But under these people, they would love to see your First Amendment rights suspended. And also the Second Amendment, which they've been trying to, to get rid of for a long time, particularly in the Democratic Party. Now here in Canada, just recently, just last night actually, as a matter of fact, a bill, Bill C-10, passed in the Canadian Parliament that seeks to censor Canadians on the internet. It seeks to censor what we can and cannot say. Now, it's going to be debated in the Senate, and hopefully the Senate will shoot it down. But the fact that they pushed this through in the morning hours, 1.30 in the morning, they passed this bill while Canadians were asleep. And so we are dealing today uh, with, we are dealing with tyrants. We are dealing with people who would love to suppress your freedom of speech, your freedom of thought. And this all comes back to hatred of God. Because where do we get these inalienable rights from? These rights come from our creator. He's given us these rights because we're his image bearers. And so with the attempt to suppress free speech, we see an attempt to not only suppress free speech, but to suppress the value of life. Uh, the unborn child, they say, is a woman's choice to kill or not to kill. That is the question. Doesn't matter if they're human or not, even though all the scientific evidence says life begins at conception. The social justice movement will say there is no such thing as objective morality. Everything is subjective. It's all based on what you think. So we go to the next slide. Uh, there again is Mark Zuckerberg. You got Jack Dorsey. Again, these are uh, the culprits today. Uh, even Wikipedia with Jimmy Wales, uh, Wikipedia uh, will, will police the content that is put on their sites. And so any content that appears to be against uh, President Biden or any content that seems to be pro-conservative, they will shut it down as alt-right, so to speak. Let's go to the next slide. Uh, combating the radical left through images. So here on the left, uh, here we see our brave men who went to war. That's at the, be the beaches of Normandy there, by the way. And these were all uh, these were allies. These were not just American soldiers. These were British soldiers, Canadian soldiers, uh, the French and so forth. 76 years ago, they did this. That's what young men were doing. These were young men. Some of them were so young that they lied about their age so they can go to war to, to fight for their country. Today, you ask a young person to do something this valiant or heroic, they will have a breakdown and claim that they need counseling. You see, folks, 76 years ago, they did this. They went to the, the beaches of Normandy, and many of them perished there. 
And they did this so middle-class spoiled brats could graffiti their memorials today. What an insult. And then you have Oprah Winfrey, uh, where Oprah Winfrey talks about things like, that's what the term white privilege is. It means that whiteness still gives you an advantage no matter what. And of course, Bridget Gabriel rightfully put out, says the black woman worth $2.6 billion. And even recently, remember uh, Oprah Winfrey when she met with Prince Harry and, and Meghan Markle, they're talking about oppression. These are people who live high on life. These are people, uh, Prince Harry has been silver spoon fed since he was born. He's never had a real job in his life, but they talk about being oppressed. And you see, this is the problem, is that the narrative is that oppression and white privilege. No one, no one seems to talk about things like Asian privilege or Italian privilege, or why don't we talk about brown privilege and so forth? All we hear about is this white privilege. And it's simply racism. That's all it is in reverse. Uh, and so someone like Oprah Winfrey, one of the, the richest women in the United States, has the audacity to talk about oppression and talk about how white people have it so good. Well, I don't have time to talk about myself growing up in a, in a, in a Portuguese family that was poor, who came from Portugal and so forth, who had to basically scrimp and save and so forth. Uh, I never had, I never got my white privilege card in the mail. Uh, but this is what you hear in, in our modern rhetoric uh, today. If we go to the next slide, there's a, a very famous passage, a quote here from President John F. Kennedy. And President Kennedy said this, all of us do not have equal talent, but all of us should have an equal opportunity to develop our talent. And what President Kennedy is saying here is the principle of equality of opportunity. What is equality of opportunity? Equality of opportunity says that everybody can make something of themselves if they apply themselves. And so the American dream is to do what? The American dream is to become what you can and want to become. So if you want to become a doctor, you work hard at it, you go to school, and you study hard and you hit those books. If you want to be a lawyer, if you want to be an engineer, in other words, opportunity, equality of opportunity says that if you work hard, you can achieve something. And where does this come from? This is the biblical principle that God laid down in Genesis 3, that by the sweat of thy brow, you shall eat your bread. What did God say? By work, you will earn your keep. And so if you work at it, if you work hard, you can become something. And this equality of opportunity that President Kennedy talks about is rooted in Holy Scripture itself, that work is honorable and that you earn your keep. You, uh, what did the Apostle Paul say to the Thessalonians? Whoever does not work should not eat. But we live in a society today where there are people saying, I don't have to work because you white folks owe me. I don't have to work. I'm gonna remain on welfare and my children will be on welfare and my grandchildren will be on welfare and on and on the vicious cycle goes on. Now, if we go to the next slide, there's a difference between what people call equality of opportunity, which is what President Kennedy was talking about. And there's something called, uh, there's, there's also something called equality of outcome. Now on the left there, equal, equality of opportunity means that if you, uh, if you uh, work at things, if you learn and work hard at things, like the guy in the middle there, the little kid in the middle there uh, thought, I'm gonna get a bigger box so that I can look over the fence and watch the game. And so the people who put out this, this meme or this poster wanted to show you that the concept of equality is not fair. What they're trying to say is that everyone should be the same. So on the right side there, this is what you have, what we call the, the equality of outcome where everyone is the same. Well, what system says that at the end of the assembly line, you're all gonna be the same? Well, this is what communism is, that the janitor makes exactly the same amount of money that the surgeon makes and that everyone is on the same level. Everyone earns the same pay. And so at the end of the day, what they're doing is they're, they're popping out these clones. Everyone's just the same at the end. 
But the problem with that is that that destroys the human spirit. It destroys incentive to better yourself and, and to improve yourself and so forth. And so the picture of equality that they're trying to show here is, is, is simply not true. I mean, the little child there, he can't look up. Well, obviously, because he's, he's a small child, he hasn't grown up yet. But this is very important that we understand that even in our universities and colleges, they're trying to push, the, push this ideology where they're basically saying every student should be the same at the end of the day. And so what they were doing in some of these universities like Harvard and others was for Asian students coming in, um, they, would, they would give them an entrance exam, but they would deduct 50 marks from them so that they'd have to work harder to achieve uh, that, that extra 50 points that they lost. And if a black student came in, they would add an extra 50 points. Now, which of these two views is, is racist? Well, it's racist to say, well, since you're Chinese, you're too smart, so we're gonna deduct 50 points from your entrance exam. But if you're an African-American, we're gonna give you a head start and give you 50 extra points. So the insinuation is that one is not as smart as the other. And so while they're trying to sound so noble and they're trying to sound so virtuous, at the end of the day, what they're doing is they are discriminating. And so America and the West was built on the principle of equality of opportunity. You work hard, you apply yourself, not this idea that we're all gonna be the same at the end of the day. That simply is not the way that Western society was built. Now, if we go to the next slide, if you really want to know the difference between conservative and progressive or socialist, conservative teaches you how to fish. The progressive side says you give a fish, a, a, a progressivism says that it gives you a fish that he stole from someone else. In other words, socialism says, you know, you guys, you rich guys, you make too much money, so we need to distribute wealth. And, and, and when you hear that phrase, distribution of wealth, your, your, your antennas should be should be up because that is exactly, that is right out of the mouth of Karl Marx. It was Marx who talked about the distribution of wealth, that the haves and the have nots, those who have, who have way too much, they don't deserve it because they've, they've stolen it on the sweat of your backs or they've used you to expand their, their businesses. And so you should distribute their wealth to those who have not. And that's where your country is heading. That's where my country is heading. And that's why we are going down a very, very dangerous path. We're teaching people that they don't have to work to eat their bread. We're telling people that some people who earn their money shouldn't have rights to that money, but that they should spread that money to the others who have not earned that money. Then in the next slide, there are some who would even say Jesus was a socialist. And so some of these folks will argue Jesus was a socialist. Of course, he was none of, none of, none of that whatsoever. Uh, some have even argued that Jesus was anti-capitalist, but he was not an anti-capitalist. In fact, if you remember his parable of the talents, you will remember that he commended the servant who had five talents, and then he worked and gained another five. He had 10, and the one who had uh, two, he worked and he had another two. He got four. That's, that, is, that is free market capitalism. But who was the one that was castigated? The one that was castigated was that one servant who only had one, one coin and he didn't do anything with it. He buried it in the ground. And then when the master returned, he said, you fool, you could have at least put it in the bank and it would have gained interest. Wow, Jesus was definitely not a socialist. He believed in the principle of working and applying yourself. And then last of all, I wanna leave you with these two quotes from two British prime ministers. Of course, the famous Winston Churchill, uh, Winston Churchill said about uh, socialism, he said, socialism is a philosophy of failure, the creed of ignorance and the gospel of envy. Its inherent virtue is the equal sharing of misery. And of course, uh, Margaret Thatcher said this, the problem with socialism is that eventually you run out of other people's money. And so this is where we are heading. This is where our country is heading. And this is only the tip of the iceberg. There is so much that is going on under that iceberg. Nine tenths of the iceberg is underwater. We're only seeing the cap, the tip. Uh, and so tomorrow I'll talk a little bit more about how this has affected um, the whole question of, of so-called intersectionality. I wanna talk a little bit about, um, about 
the attack on gender, especially as it affects our little children in our, in our schools and so forth, and the impact that's gonna have for our future. And so what I'll do there, uh, Zach, is I'll, I'll just stop there. Uh, I just wanna make sure that I leave some uh, minutes for questions. So I'll turn it over to you, Zach. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah. yeah, my apologies for the technical difficulties. It defaulted to uh, not allow you to screen, screen share, but we'll work that out for you tomorrow. Sure. So, so, not so you'll have the full ability, ability to do that. that. So, so are, are, are you willing, willing to take, to take questions, questions from, from the audience, audience for, tonight? for tonight? Absolutely. Okay. okay. So, any, any questions? questions? I'll, I'll, I'll actually, actually come, come to you with the mic. mic. Dr. Tony, I think, I, think I, I, got I got this, this right here. Yeah, uh, uh, socialism, progressivism, progressivism says, uh, teaching, teaching our children, they should be no winners and no losers. Is that correct? The whole progressive movement says that at the end, everyone's equal. Everyone's the same. And so there should be no winners uh, or losers. Um, but then they, their, their, their narrative changes because they say that the, the, the white man, the white straight male Christian has been the winner for way too long. And so it's time for the white man to pay reparations. That's why you hear a lot of talk about reparations for slavery and so forth. Uh, so they talk from both sides of their mouth. They say that we're all the same at the end of the day. There's no winners or losers. But then what they'll do is they'll attack anything that uh, has to do with historic Christianity, anything that has to do with uh, the, the freedoms that we have in the West. And so that's why they will demonize the founding fathers. Uh, they will topple their statues, tear them down. Just They're doing that up here now in Canada. They're toppling the, the statues of our first prime minister, Johnny MacDonald. And uh, so uh, that's the argument, uh, Pastor Sasser. But on the other end of the spectrum, uh, they will claim that uh, the white man has been the oppressive winner for too long, and we need to take him down. Any, Any other questions? questions? Going once. Hey, hey Tony, Tony, it's uh, David, David Leon. Leon. Um, hey, David. And, 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 and I'm sure we do this a little bit tomorrow, tomorrow but just, just as, a, as, a as a prelude, prelude, or prelude, prelude, prelude what, what, what should, should the Christian response be? Should we, should we, be, what should should we, we be doing as Christians, Christians particularly, particularly new covenant, covenant Christians, to address, address this issue, issue in a manner that, that brings people, people to Jesus as opposed to reinforcing their beliefs that we are the to begin with? Right. Well, what I do is I, I believe that uh, bringing the law of God to bear on their conscience is very important because what I do in my discussions with people in, in the social justice movement is I point out that we, we are all guilty before God, not only guilty before God, but we are all, all uh, guilty of the very things we accuse others of doing. And so uh, it's a fact that all great civilizations have practiced slavery, including Africans. Africans uh, not only enslaved their own, but sold them to the Western Europeans. Uh, today in West Africa, there are black Muslims who own black slaves. So my, what I try to do is I try to say, look, we're all in this together. We're all corrupt. There is no one who does good. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. So there is no, there is no pointing the finger at, well, this white guy did this because um, in my in my uh, research on social justice, uh, the Native Americans uh, raped and pillaged and stole the, uh, tribal property from from others and cannibalized their enemies and so forth. We can talk about the Aztecs doing the same down in in Mexico and South America. Um, and what they generally accuse the the the, the Western European nations of doing um, in terms of conquest. What I what I point out is look. All civilizations uh, engaged in conquest, every single one of them. And, and so what I try to do is I try to show them that uh, blaming a little white girl, a, a little white American girl for what happened in, 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 in slavery, in, in, in the transatlantic slave trade, is the same as blaming a little Japanese girl for Pearl Harbor, just because she's Japanese. 
And so what I try to do is say, look, there is no one righteous before God. All have sinned. And so in Romans 3, what does Paul say? Paul says the law shuts every mouth so that no one can boast before God. And so the law puts us all in the same category. We are sinners. We are condemned. We are guilty as charged, not just before a holy God, but we are guilty against each other. And so there is no uh, oppressor versus the oppressed here. It's not to say there haven't been abuses. Of course there have in human history. But my whole point is to show that at the end of the day, we are not much different. We are, we are fallen people. We all make mistakes. Our ancestors were not always, you know, the best moral examples and so forth. So I think that talking about the forgiveness of God in Christ, that that God forgives us all our sins, and that in Christ there is no Jew, there is no Greek, no Gentile, there is no slave, no freeman, there is no male, no female. And what does that say? Well, that in Christ, uh, ethnic dif differences, sexual differences, we are saved the same way by faith in Christ by the grace of God. And so it's not to say that the Jew is better than the Gentile, which many of them thought they were, but that Jews and Gentiles both are condemned by God's law and both of them are saved by the same Messiah. Um, and, and therefore, the body of Christ is made up of many nations from every tribe, every tongue. And that is why this, this rhetoric about critical race theory which, which seeks to blame everything on, 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 on the white man is so fracturous, it is so divisive that it, it breaks the body of Christ and it creates schism. And one of the things the Lord hates is discord among brethren. He hates schism. Uh, and so this is why it's such, a, it's such a dangerous ideology because it is by nature divisive. It is divisive by nature. And, and you could see that. Just look at America today. It, it hasn't been so divided as it is today. Even here in Canada, it has not been so divided as it is today because these politicians keep blaming certain groups of Americans for the faults that have occurred. And therefore, it creates this mistrust against each other. And we begin to look at each other as enemies rather than seeing ourselves as, as part of the common lot of humanity, fallen, sinful, and the need of a, of a wonderful savior. Uh, Doug Gooden, Colorado Springs. What, uh, what are your students, where are they at in all of this? They're, they're actually, they're actually um, very strongly rooted in scripture. Um, some seminaries that I have taught at, but not full time, I've seen some seminaries uh, basically go into this into this woke mentality, this critical race theory mentality, and now the students are coming out of there not as Christians but as socialists. And so, with my students, um, they are ver they are very well researched. They're very well read and they are grounded in, in what scripture has to say about our human identity and what scripture has to say about the universality of sin. And so they already know, they, they, they've been taught to, to, to be aware of the buzzwords that you hear in college and in university. There was a North Korean woman uh, just recently, a North Korean lady who was being interviewed by Dr. Jordan Peterson. It's, it's on YouTube. Uh, it, I would highly recommend it. And uh, she lived under the tyrannical government of North Korea, and she escaped uh, with her family across the border into China, risking her life and those of her family. And uh, she reports how eventually she came to the United States and she studied at Columbia. And she said that she was horrified to find out that the rhetoric that they were teaching at Columbia University, which is, which again is a prestigious university, the rhetoric she was hearing there was the same divisive rhetoric that she was taught in North Korea. Now that is shocking for someone to say, I came to America looking for freedom and I went to university and I found out that what my professors were telling me was the same thing that I was being taught in North Korea. So take for example, very quick example, in North Korea, let's say your grandfather committed a crime against the state. Well, they have what's called the four generation rule, 
which means that his his children and his grandchildren and his great grandchildren will be prisoners for life. They will be serving in prison for life because of the sin of their great grandfather. Now here in Canada and America and in the West, what do you find? Well, by virtue of the fact that you're white, you are thereby guilty in the slave trade. You are thereby guilty in oppressing the Native Americans just because of your skin color. So it's the same ideology that you are being blamed because you belong to a certain group, a category of a group. Uh, and so I teach my students to, to understand the Marxist origins of this type of thinking, and they become very attuned to the rhetoric and the language that is being used in these various groups uh, in, in, in the West. Uh, so I think education is key here. I think that the church has to wake up. It, it is affecting the church. I mean, look at Tim Keller. Uh, look at um, uh, even John Piper has been has been playing with this idea as well of this this whole socialism idea and, and Christianity. And um, Nine Marks Church as well uh, has gone down that path. I think uh, Mark Dever. So what I am saying is, it's very easy to be sucked into this to this ideology because you sound you seem virtuous that you're there to help the downtrodden and so forth it has nothing to do with with helping the downtrodden it is an ideology that is not only divisive it is antichrist to its core because it goes back to marx and and many of these advocates one of the blm co-founders who now lives in beverly hills in a very upstate uh area uh majority white population say, when she said she never would live in an area with a lot of whites um, um she 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 certainly benefited from capitalism and she openly admitted openly admitted that our roots are marxist we have our, our roots are in marxism so so there's there's the danger it's it's the very source of this movement is satanic and anti-christian hi tony this is gary scott hi gary uh, i have i want to follow up on your comments about uh, keller piper and others part of the struggle in all of this is kind of the double speak the new speak yeah. you're not sure what they mean so how are we able, uh, the, the social justice movement has affected not just the world, but it's affected churches, it's affected the Southern Baptist Convention have gone yep. through that thing recently. How are we able to discern? How does the person in the pew discern whether the leader that has written good things, said good things in the past, how do we know when they've gone from you know, being woke you know, I mean, from being orthodox to kind of going down the woke hole. Yeah, uh, well, usually the, the a clear indicator is when they start blaming uh, white Christians, when they start bringing color into it. Like just today on Twitter, Tim Keller uh, said something about, um, said something about you don't need a white evangelical to tell you about Christianity and you don't need them to tell you about uh, what God is doing in, in China and Africa and so forth. And I, and I tweeted back to Tim Keller and I said, uh, what does color have to do with this? What does group identity politics have to do with it? So usually it starts off with saying that white Christians are privileged. White Christians have taken their privilege for granted. They have not considered what has gone, uh, what has happened to, to other Christians like African-American Christians or Latino Christians. Um, uh, and so it, it usually begins, think of Thabati, uh, 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 Thabati for example, who's a former Muslim. Um, he, was, he, he went right into the whole reparations movement that America owes the African-American people uh, money because of what they did to their ancestors and bringing them out of Africa and so forth. So the moment they bring color into it, especially white Christians and privilege, words like privilege, uh, these are usually buzzwords that indicate that they are they are moving into that that progressive Christianity, that critical race theory ideology. So it generally begins with whiteness, talking about how privileged white Christians are, and uh, and and it talks about how we have not uh, repented or we have not made uh, we have not made reparations or penance 
for what we have done to our African-American brothers. So usually it, it starts with racial talk and privilege. Those are the two main buzzwords, racial talk and the word privilege being attached to whiteness. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Just, Just one, one more, more question, question from Bill Sasser. Sasser. Sure. Dr. Dr. Kostler, Kostler, I, I, I think you answered, answered really the question, question that I had, had. and it, it was this, this that, that this kind of thinking, thinking by inference, especially, especially in the West, West means, means that, that we, we must, must come, come to a conclusion, conclusion that the Christian himself, himself or herself, herself is, is evil. evil. Because, because in the, the West, West that's associated, associated with, with, quote, white, white Christianity, Christianity, even though its, it's origin, origin is not so. So, so would, would you say, say that's true? true? That, that Christians will eventually be hated because, in other words, words Christianity, Christianity will, will be redefined uh, other than, than biblical Christianity. Christianity. Now, now, when we, we have people, people you probably address this tomorrow, tomorrow who uh, uh, lesbian, lesbian, homosexual, transgender, all that, all that they're, they're not, not to be looked look upon as perverted, as perverted. Uh, they, they can, can be, be Christians, Christians too. too. And so, so therefore, therefore Christians, Christians by influence, influence will become, become wicked, wicked people, people. Biblical yes. Christians. Yes, yes. I mean, it's already happening in the uh, in the United States here. In Canada, we had a Baptist minister who, who came out proudly saying, I identify as a woman. Uh, and, and he was a Baptist minister. And uh, we have people in the Church of England, in the Anglican Church, the Episcopalian Church, as you know, appointing homosexual bishops and so forth. And I think what we're seeing here is I think we're beginning to see the, the, the division of the sheep from the goats. Uh, we're beginning to see the, the difference between the wheat and the tares. We're, we're beginning to see, I think, a purifying work of God, a winnowing, if you will, uh, of the chaff from the wheat. And I think it's becoming very clear that Christians who hold to biblical standards are being, um, are being demonized. Uh, they're being attacked as fundamentalists. They're being attacked as bigots. Whereas Christians that are progressive and are embracing the LGBTQ movement, there are, there are even some who are embracing abortion. Uh, there are some who are embracing the transgender movement. Um, and so what they're doing right here in Canada, just this morning uh, in, uh, in uh, British Columbia, uh, two churches were burned down. Two church buildings were burned down. Uh, and, the, and, and this has a lot to do with the, we call them the Aboriginal people. Uh, you call them Native Americans. The indigenous people uh, are, 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 there's suspicion that they're the ones who set the churches on fire uh, because they're claiming that the white man came and and took their land and raped their land and the white man basically forced converted them to christianity uh and, and so i think you're going to start seeing uh violent attacks on, on churches uh you won't see violent attacks against islam if, if that happened that would make national news and uh and president biden would probably go to the vigil but um it's becoming it's becoming uh very common for Christians to be um, mocked in the media, that is biblical Christians. Um, and I think we're going to see real persecution right here in Canada, uh, in the province of Alberta, we've had uh, three pastors arrested simply for keeping their churches open to minister to the people of God. And these three pastors had their churches closed and locked up by order of the government. Uh, there is a pastor right now, Pastor Tim Stevens from Calgary, Alberta, who was, who was, a, who was arrested uh, a week before Father's Day in front of his own children and his wife. And the second time he was arrested, he's still uh, currently incarcerated uh, just for the sin of keeping his church open and defying the so-called public health order uh, about COVID. And, and no one in his congregation ever got sick. Um, I have friends here where I live in not far from Toronto who had their churches locked by the government and now they're meeting in the lawn and they're up to about $100,000 in fines and uh, a possibility of, of five to six years in prison. So we are 
going through persecution here in the Great White North. Um, and I believe it will eventually come down to the United States. I think in Democrat run states, I think we're seeing a lot of that. So I agree with you, Pastor Sasser, that the, the lines of the dividing line is being firmly put into the ground. And we are beginning to see the separation of the wheat and the tares, the counterfeits uh, in the church. And the world loves the progressive church because it is no different than the world. Thank, Thank you, Dr. Costa. Costa. So, so we'll, we'll get, get the technical, technical issues, issues worked, worked out, out so you're, you're in complete control of the slide. slide. So, so thank, thank you very, very much for my pleasure. with us. And, and so, so we look, we look forward, forward to when we'll be able to see you in person. person so. Amen. We'll, we'll see you tomorrow.